It's exciting times, um, especially when it comes to generative AI. Um, that being said, a lot of jobs will be rendered obsolete. Um, but new jobs, new careers, um, new industries will sprout. Um, it's what I'm focused on in my entrepreneurial career as well as my philanthropic. So in Los Angeles, um, we serve around 12,000 students, teaching them computer science and robotics, as well as preparing them for college. I started 12 years ago with just 65 kids, and that's accelerated in, in over the decade, um, serving 12,000 and growing. So, um, and my entrepreneurial career in um, communications and generative AI is to show inner city kids what's possible when applying yourself. I know I come from music, but technology is going to transform how we make music, how we govern music as far as legal representation, um, business planning, all of that's going to be shifted and changed in, in this next decade. And for you, AI is something that can be used very much creatively. And I think you've shown that with FYI. Maybe you want to talk to us about, about that platform. Yeah, so if you're like a hyper creative, no matter what field you're in, storytelling, music writing, um, fashion design, you're usually that one island and you're, uh, you're a nuisance to your friends who don't <laughs> you know, think at the speed that you think. And every once in a while you're looking for that muse or that banter partner to share ideas with, to help you improve your ideas. And, and every once in a while you get frustrated um, trying to you know, find and um, curate that circle or that group think, that brainstorming cluster to help you fine tune your ideas. And good luck if you find that person. And eventually you're gonna exhaust that person <laughs> if you're a hyper creative. And what I've seen with, um, just personally with myself, with FYI and our um, generative AI in the loop, there is no fatigue. There's, there is no attitude, there is no compromise in the, ba the back and forth brainstorming banter ping pong to materialize an idea from any section or sector of creativity. Um, it's, it's fantastic and it's gonna liberate, it's gonna supercharge every single creative. I'm totally with you on that. You know, I can exhaust my producer over that Bijan with all sorts of questions about scripts, but ChatGPT and I these days, we're sparring. I, I go back to AI all the time. Do it again, but what about this? But what about that? What about that? Yeah, and this is going to get even more fruitful when all the other giants release their version of generative AI. Um, GPT is awesome. Uh, this is, they're the first step into this field. There's going to be folks that are working on um, different unique modules, uh, FYIs as well. Google will release theirs or improve theirs. Facebook will release theirs. Amazon will release theirs. Folks that come from, you know, hidden parts of the world that you haven't even heard of yet. Um, Mustafa from Inflection AI, the guy that was the founder of DeepMind, would eventually release his. It's going to be a very fruitful um, playing field for creatives to choose a selection of generative AIs. Well, you mentioned Google, so let's go to Doran on the end. Um, from your perspective, from Google's perspective. Oh, that's Google. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you guys know each other? No, I just, I just like Google. <laughs> <laughs> um, what technology do you think is the big one for transforming the world we're living in? Google has been in this journey for a couple of decades, actually. AI is not new. Uh, in fact, it powers most of the products uh, you know and I hope love. Uh, like Google Search uh, and YouTube. Um, but there's more uh, out there. Uh, we're doing already some uh, co collaborations with government and using uh, AI to make the world a better place. Just to give you one example, and then I'll get to uh, Bard in a second, that's our generative AI service. Um, we have uh, flood forecasting tools uh, that use very complex AI models to forecast floods. But we don't stop there. We're sending text messages uh, to people on the ground that may be affected. And uh, two years ago, for example, we sent over 100 million such text messages and really saved people's lives, right? So, and this is done driven by AI. 
Now, obviously, these are exciting times. Uh, and last week, as, as Will I am said, we uh, announced uh, BARD. Uh, and BARD is our conversational AI service. And you can think about, of BARD as um, a tool that combines the wealth of the world information on the one hand with the creativity of large language models. Um, but it's important to get it right. So that's why we announced that we're sending it out to trusted testers, because we, before we launch it out to the public, and this will happen in a few weeks, we really want to get it right in sense of quality, responsibility, uh, and groundedness in real world data, right? But when this comes out, this will allow numerous opportunities to engage in different ways uh, with information and really solve complex problems. I can tell you I've been testing BART for a long time, <laughs> and it's my, it's my best buddy out there. Um, but AI also comes with risks, uh, and we need to acknowledge that. Uh, and here, I think it's both it's a joint responsibility of companies, of uh, governments to work together on those issues. Um, you know, as uh, our CEO Sundar Pichai said, uh, you know, AI is too important not to be regulated, mm. right? So we welcome those, this joint journey. Obviously, any kind of regulation should be risk-based, it should be proportional, it should allow innovation to happen, but at the same time, it should really kind of put together a clear guardrails uh, for the way forward. And I'm really excited about the way forward. Sujay, you are invested in so many companies. You're always looking out for the next hot thing in tech. You know, you bet your future on it. Is it AI for you as well? Well, I've, I've begun to think that AI, just when you interact with it, it's almost like a reaction to having to manage millennials for so long. <laughs> I am a millennial. You can, well, so am I, I guess, technically. <laughs> but you, you, can, uh, you can ask it a question, and it doesn't demand a promotion with one accurate response <laughs> or a pay raise. So it's, uh, I think it's, it's going to be revolutionary. There's lots of things, there's lots of markets that we look at where AI is going to transform things. Of course, what Will's doing with FYI is pretty, pretty awesome. He was showing it to us last night. Um, but, you know, there's, there are a number of other areas where just technological transformation is affecting everything we're doing. You know, one of the things uh, that you and I were talking about on Friday was the idea that all of us have become obsessed with everything that's happening around climate and mm -hmm. climate change and sustainability. And, and yet, when you think about it from a policy lens, despite so much effort around the world having gone into it, the person that's most responsible is not a politician, for driving us forward here, it's, it's actually Elon Musk, <laughs> which is crazy. Now, he, it wasn't without help from government. You said that on the phone and I said, no. And then I thought about it, I thought, yeah, I think you might be right. I think Elon Musk may have done more for climate change the, the than the government. The second largest contributor to climate change is the transportation industry. And that entire industry is electrifying because of one company. And that's the truth. Now, that company wouldn't exist without massive government subsidies, but I think there's this intersection between policy and incentivizing great entrepreneurs, that if you combine the two, you get magic. If you just have one, i.e. government, you're probably not going to end up with really great outcomes. Well, we'll talk more, I think, about what governments can do and what they can learn. Um, but Will, I am, let's talk about the challenges and the risks that are associated with a tech like AI. And they are huge. And I think governments and companies are put off by them. Uh, one of which is uh, algorithmic biases. Mm. Um, it's the reason why we do the work philanthropically at our foundation is to inspire young kids um, that come from the inner city, people of color, to aim themselves to train algorithms, write algorithms, train data, because um, the only people that are going to fix algorithmic, algorithmic biases are folks that look like me writing and training data, uh, writing algorithms and training data. You can't depend on folks to understand your sensitivity that don't understand the culture that you come from. Um, and uh, until we have that, it, there's always going to be some version of um, bias in the algorithms. Yeah, and I think inclusivity is important, and so is regulation, I think. And, and Doran, from your perspective, working with governments, this is a very complicated two-way street because governments can learn so much from tech but tech also needs to heed government regulation, and perhaps there needs to be more. Yeah, I, I agree. I know, you know, it's a, it's a two-way street. Uh, collaboration is key, 
uh, and there are projects so when it comes to AI where you can clearly collaborate with governments. Uh, I think this is, as I alluded to earlier, I think there are spaces where government need to lean in uh, and set the guardrails for the whole industry. Uh, but then it, the, the most important piece here is, is collaboration and listening to one another, right? Um, I think also when it comes to AI, that what's something that I've seen uh, very freq frequently is what holds government back from adopting AI it's government itself, right? Uh, so you see the reluctance among policymakers to lean into, into new technologies. Um, and uh, some, com some governments really get it right. Uh, so if you want to lean into new technologies and be you know, the top of your game, uh, you need in a way to act, look, and feel more like a startup. Uh, so for example, you can look at the UAE government. Minister of AI. Yeah, right. Yeah, uh, Omar, you, you know, what's up? Uh, you stole my thunder. Uh, <laughs> Minister, Minister of AI is one example. Another example is CEO, CEOs of innovations, uh, of innovation that will be in, every, in each and every ministry in the UAE. So that's great. That's exactly the right way forward. Uh, you know, and, and my plea to the uh, government leaders here in the audience is approach this with an open mind, with excitement about the future. Don't just get the stick out to bash tech down. Um, of course, governments can learn a lot from startups, but it's really hard. You know, governments, politicians live, what, three, four year terms? It's very hard sometimes, I think, to take a long term view. Um, Sujay, what do you think governments can learn from startups? How can they move faster? Well, it, it requires embracing risk, which is somewhat antithetical to government. I mm -hmm. think the core reason that the, there's so much bureaucracy is actually because it's a well-defined process to make sure that no mistakes happen, right? Like, so if you have a giant, you know, if you have a, if you have a, a system that is highly repeatable, that becomes a bureaucracy to manage that system. And the whole point of that system is to achieve a very specific outcome with no, with no variance, with no risk. And the, the problem in innovation is that it's all about risk and it's all about mistakes. And you, know, you mentioned that you can have a much longer time horizon as an entrepreneur. It's actually the opposite. Most entrepreneurs like from year to year are hoping that they'll be funded. Mm -hmm. And you have to prove something in very short time horizons to get more capital to keep doing what you want to do. And so it's, it's actually the speed that entrepreneurs, like that the best entrepreneurs use as like their, their, their kind of driving force that governments, if you want to, if you want to like drive innovation, it has to be with that mindset. You have to be able to make mistakes. And move fast. Interesting. Um, what about all the data? Because at the moment, whether we're talking about AI, whether we're talking about IoT, where we're looking at devices, the zettabytes of data that are being created every day is overwhelming, not necessarily particularly well regulated, and it needs to be protected. It needs to be used equitably. We don't even know as consumers how much data is out there about us. We don't know how it's being used. Well, um, I think you are interested in this being legislated. Um, the, uh, with more imagination around legislated. You don't like the term legislated? Um, I like the... the I'm, I'm American. I love the concept of uh, and the principles behind our Constitution and our Bill of Rights. I think the same thing needs to be with data, especially when infused and, and, and gathered by artificial intelligence. Um, and that AI constitution or bill of rights um, for everyone working in AI should sign that. Like we have the Declaration of Independence in, in America and, and our constitution. You know who signed it. You know it was governed conceptually by, with, with moral. It was, there was, it was moral at the core. And today with companies and their business models that abuse data, um, strip away people's civil liberties and uh, privacy um, because their business model is based on that, um, I think with AI it gets worse. Mm. Um, I fear the day that I'll get a call from something that looks like my mom, knows everything that my mom knows about me, um, and it's not my mom. Well, Hiroshi could probably create a doppelganger robot. <laughs> no, no, those things, those doppelgangers <laughs> are awesome. Uh, he's, he's like, I'm, I'm like fanning out because yeah. he, he's, uh, he's one of my favorite people in, in the world when it comes to technology. I always right. wanted to meet him. Um, um, but that being said, that could be abused. That being said, you know, 
what if we are be- if we're barely dealing with fake news, imagine fake everything. That that we have to there's serious question marks that we have to put around that. What type of future are we walking into if we're not careful, if we're not governed by, you know, the moral north star that Technology is supposed to connect us. Technology is supposed to help us solve problems, not create a mess where we don't trust anything on the screen, right? So we should trust the screen. Right now, the, tra- the screen is question mark. Do we trust it or not? And I think a lot of it, a lot of it is transparency and knowing what data is created and who has rights to it. From big tech's perspective, and you may not like the term big tech, but what do you want to see in this area that's good for business but protects people and also lends trust, which I think is a real key part of this? Trust is currency tomorrow. Mm. Yeah. So uh, I agree with everything uh, uh, Will I am said. I think uh, you know, it's a responsibility, it's a collective responsibility of private sector, civil society, governments to get it right. In fact, you know, we're, there's a big hype now about large language models. The first language model was in Lambda, was introduced by Google two years ago, right? Uh, and the reason we didn't send it out there uh, to the world was because we wanted to have a very responsible approach. Uh, a few years back, we published the Google principles of AI. We're the first company globally to do that. Uh, and there's a very clear set of principles that's available online on how do we approach AI, how do we uh, develop it. Uh, Will I mentioned uh, earlier bias. Bias mm. is a huge issue, right? The, the, the data you train the AI on, right? And it's need to be representative of who we are. Uh, and the world is not just Europe and the US, right? And we can see it here in this, uh, in this conference. So it's a, it's, a big, it's a big challenge. I think the problems that we know of abusing AI is something we should be you know, very mindful of. Um, for example, creating deep fakes. Uh, we're now working at Google on technologies that will allow people to identify big tech. Uh, and in a way, it all goes back to our first, uh, pre- first the mission of Google, right? It's to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. And deep fake data is not useful. It causes harm, right? Um, so now we're thinking about this very, in a very kind of uh, uh, responsible way. Uh, it will take time. Uh, it will make mistakes. Uh, but we need to acknowledge that and, and work together uh, you know, collectively to get it to the right place. It's one of the biggest uh, societal, um, um, I think, challenges that we have today. Sujay, your perspective from the startups and maybe from Dropbox as well, do you think you have a different perspective in terms of what regulation is needed for tech? It's, there's, it's a really difficult question because anytime someone says, I know what the truth is, and what, you're, what you think the truth is is false, I get very nervous. Because over time, we've learned that lots of things that we were convinced were true in the past turned out to not be exactly the way it was represented. I mean, there's lots of examples of that. So it's, it's a complicated issue. The, um, the biggest thing is I think guardrails need to be set by the policymakers, not by the companies. At the end of the day, every company has a profit motive. And you're going to make lots of micro decisions that lead you to drive like a bigger and bigger business. And that's, that's the inertia of a company. For better or for worse, virtually everyone in the tech industry is compensated with stock, which means that all of us are motivated by the, a rising stock price. And so if government doesn't step in and set guardrails, it's inevitable that the profit motive will overwhelm doing the right thing. Final thoughts. We're in our last 30 seconds. Will I am? Final thoughts? Um, if you have a niece, a nephew, a daughter, a son, um, inspire them, encourage them to take interest in this field. Um, we need more people of color, um, more folks that come from poverty-stricken areas to create algorithms, train data, train models. It's, it's super important. Um, we are in, in this age that we're in right now. And so I, I encourage folks to do that. More into STEM. I wish I'd been more focused on that. I wish I worked in AI. CJ. Well, and to, to build on that, so I, I teach at Stanford, and one of the things that's happened over the last 10 years is the, pers- the number one most popular cl- uh, graduate, graduating degree for undergrads is computer science. And that's becoming true at virtually every major American university. 
I'm not sure if that's true outside the U.S., but it's certainly true in the U.S. And the beauty of that is now people that are thinking through these problems are not just thinking through them as consumers, they're thinking as people who actually know how to build these products, or at least have a, have a conceptual framework for building them. And so I think what we need to do is bring more people with this kind of background into government and policymaking. Yeah. Because yeah. then you'll have a much deeper and richer understanding of the problem. And, and the things that you may be afraid of may turn out to be not worrisome at all. And there are probably things that we're not paying attention to that are much more scary than, than we realized. And so I think bringing computer scientists, engineers, scientists into, into policymaking is a really big opportunity. Final word for you. I think this is the time for governments to become digital sprinters, right? Uh, it's not just the t setting the digital infrastructure right or preparing people for the jobs of the future or setting smart policies. It's all of the above. So we need to think about this holistically. And those digital sprinters will not just stay informed. They will also implement the right policies in place. And they will also capture all the economic opportunity. Thank you all. That was wonderful. Excellent thoughts. Thank you all for being here this morning. Thank you. Thank you.